Hello, and welcome to another edition of Bill of Rights Institute's Close Reads. My name is Kirk Higgins, and I'm the Director of Content here at the Bill of Rights Institute. Um, and for those of you who are new to the channel, um, every other week um, on Thursdays, we take a look at different primary sources and Supreme Court cases from throughout American history. Um, and unpack, I'm looking for important constitutional and perennial questions um, that we can continue to use to learn about the world that's around us today. Uh, this week, we're looking at an important Supreme Court decision um, called New York Times Company versus U.S. from 1971. Um, to help me with unpacking this case, uh, I am fortunate to be joined by my colleague, Josh Smith. Hello, Josh. Hey, Kurt. So, Josh, this court case gets at a lot of really important Supreme Court questions when it comes to sort of liberty and security, right? Um, and, you know, this in particular has to do with, with the free press. So could you just tell me, like, what, what is it? Um, you work with these current events all the time. You're always thinking about these constitutional questions. What is it about this case that kind of makes us think about um, our constitutional order and sort of the role of government within society? Sure. So the core question of this case is, how should the United States balance between the freedom of the press and national security? So we have these two really important principles that, that um, basically every American uh, holds true in their heart. Um, it's a, a founding principles of the U.S. freedom of the press, alongside national security. Of course, we all want to stay safe. We all need national security in order to protect our other rights. So the question is, what happens if those two come in conflict with each other? And that that's been a there is nothing new about that. There's nothing unique about that. That's been happening throughout our history, we grapple with that question. Even in the modern day, we have examples like Edward Snowden and um, WikiLeaks, things like that, where there's information that some people think should be released to the public, and they argue it's press freedom, while others argue no, that actually threatens our national security. So it's, it's um, really important constitutional questions that come up that need to be grappled with. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, we're thinking about free press, you know, I think it's a phrase that gets thrown around a lot, but what we're really talking about is the ability for the press, and that doesn't just mean newspapers, it really means anyone, um, to have this idea that, that you are investigating and looking at these different issues um, quick aside, I always think this is interesting. I always thought of free press as in newspapers, um, but I realized that free press actually means the technology of the press, right? It's dissemination of information, um, which is really interesting. And I think in this case, um, what we're looking at is the ability for that information to be distributed and talked about freely being balanced with uh, this concern over national security, right? There's certain things that our government, um, certain information that our government wants to protect in order to protect us um, as a nation. Um, and those two things, this like desire for information and the need for that information to be able to hold the government accountable um, conflicts a lot of the time with that uh, desire for the government to keep something secret so that um, those who would do harm to the nation or those who may not have our best interests at heart um, uh, don't get a hold of that information, right? And it's this push and pull um, that gets sorted out in our government and our society through this dialogue. Um, but that balance is something that's really tricky. So what do you say, Josh, we take a look at this case and find out more of, of what we're talking about with this balance? Sounds good. So the case is New York Times Company v. U.S. So we were talking about press freedom and we're talking about balancing national security. Um, so New York Times Company is the New York Times newspaper, right? Um, and we're talking about national security because it's in the late 60s, early 70s, and the United States is involved in the Vietnam War. Um, so Josh, could you just, by way of historical context, let us know what, what's going on? What brought this case about? Um, what, what are these things called the Pentagon Papers um, that are that is sort of at the heart of this case? Um, and and what's, what's really the question that's at hand here? Sure. So the U.S. has been involved in the Vietnam War uh, for really since the late 50s or so in some form or another. So by, by the end of the 1960s, uh, things are really escalating. They're actually sending in U.S. troops, ground forces, things like that. And the um, Secretary of Defense, Robert Mac McNamara, um, he commissions a report to basically study the history of U.S. strategy and policy in Vietnam. 
to kind of track how things have been going? Are we meeting our goals? Things like that. Um, and informally, these papers become known as the Pentagon Papers, this report. Now, there's a man named Daniel Ellsberg who works for the Rand Corporation. And they're a think tank, and they do a lot of studies for national security. And he helped put together this report for the Secretary of Defense. Um, now, Ellsberg, as he works on this report, he becomes um, disillusioned with the Vietnam War. And he, he thinks that the war is unwinnable. He thinks that American leaders have been lying to the people when they say that that the US is actually winning the war. So he actually makes copies of the Pentagon Papers illegally, of course. This is a very top secret project that uh, very few people know about. It was definitely not planned to be released to the public. So he illegally makes photocopies of this. And he um, then uh, after a bit of time, he gets in contact with uh, the New York Times, a reporter there, Neil Sheehan. And um, Neil Sheehan actually makes copies of uh, Ellsberg's copy. And uh, Sheehan then proceeds to uh, publish this with the New York Times. Right. And so then the question of this case is over whether or not that was a violation. Obviously, the Pentagon Papers were classified. Uh, set of documents um, classified, meaning um, that the government has deemed them to be of an importance to national security. Um, and so therefore the publication of them um, is prohibited and here was seen as, as a criminal act. And so when the newspapers published these um, documents, uh, the Nixon administration essentially comes out and says, no, you can't do that. Or I guess it wasn't the administration, it was the, the court they, they, they sought out an injunction against the newspaper to prevent those papers from being published. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. So it's the term here is prior restraint. So that that's basically um, when the government seeks a court order to prevent the publication of information um, prior to it being published. So normally, um, the government might look at something that already has been published and say, you need to redact that, that's dangerous to security or it's, it's untruthful, whatever. But prior restraint specifically is even prior to it being published, uh, the government is restraining it. And there, um, there's a lot of questions around how constitutional prior restraint is. The Supreme Court has generally said prior to this case, they said, Basically, prior restraint is really never acceptable. Um, granted, that could mean there, there may be some cases, like very extreme cases, where they would allow it. But in general, the Supreme Court has always um, very strongly ruled against prior restraint. And, and this case is actually going to deal with it again, because the, the government's going to say, actually, no, this is justified here because this is one of those extreme examples of national security requiring it. Great, and so then the question specifically for this case is, and we have it on the screen, did the Nixon administration efforts to prevent the publication of what a term classified information violate the First Amendment, right? So again, this broader constitutional question of how are we balancing free press uh, and uh, national security needs is, is in this case expressed um, this way. Um, and it's interesting, you know, talking about freedom of the press, again, First Amendment, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of the press. Pretty straightforward. Um, obviously, what's happening here is a challenge to that principle. And you noted earlier prior restraint. So that is a form of censorship that allows the government to review the content of materials and prevent their publication um, can be seen as, as a challenge to that. Um, because it's essentially the government intervening and saying, no, we can't have that. And here in this instance, obviously, it's um, I always think it's important too to understand what's going on with the Vietnam War. So um, there's a trans, there's been a transition in administrations, right? So um, Richard Nixon is elected um, and becomes president around this time. Um, previous to that, you had had the Tet Offensive and sort of increasing involvement in Vietnam in 1968, 1967, 1968. Um, and at home in the United States, you have this large uh, and growing frustration with the war, people being confused about 
um, what what's happening there. You have tensions, you have people on both sides. Many people are, are strongly in favor of our fighting in Vietnam and fighting against communism. Others think that this isn't the appropriate way to contest communism, that there is an unwinnable war in Vietnam and that we're spending lots of money and lives and we're not really doing anything that's effective. Um, and that's resulting in, in protest movements across the nation. Um, you know, so, so tensions are high. And so it's into that sort of mix um, that this case gets dropped and that the, that the administration um, makes this proclamation. Um, and so how, how does the court find in this case, Josh? So it's a six to three decision. The court rules in favor of the New York Times that the, um, the prior restraint that, uh, that the government is seeking is unconstitutional, that the, um, the courts cannot. Uh, so actually there, there were some lower courts that had ruled that there, they could grant an injunction um, against the, the Times um, in order to stop the publication. And so the Supreme Court is actually reviewing, reviewing those lower court decisions and they ruled that injunction is actually unconstitutional. And they release a per curiam opinion. So a per curiam is an unsigned opinion. It's usually brief and it's designed to reflect unity in the decision. So even though it's a it is six to three, so it's not unanimous by any means. But um, the reason why they did this, I think, is to show a, a stronger sense of unity. And we have just a, a quick quote from here. Again, it's very short. And actually, the vast majority of it is just quoting previous opinions. So um, any system of prior restraints of expression comes to this court bearing a heavy presumption against its constitutional validity. So like we mentioned before, the court in general has said no prior restraint is, is unacceptable and the government needs to make an extremely strong case to show why it's gonna be used. And then they go on and quote, um, you know, the government carries a heavy burden of showing justification for the imposition of such a restraint. And I, it's interesting how they, they seem to really only quote previous cases in this per curiam opinion. And I think really they're they're hesitant to try and uh, act like this is anything new. They're just saying, look, we're going to quote other other opinions that have already settled this question. We we don't really need to settle anything new. Prior restraint is unconstitutional, um, basically always, and we're going to continue to uphold that. Yeah, and I think this is really interesting because again, we're thinking about this bigger conversation about how we balance national security and freedom of the press, right? But you could also see that as free speech. You could see it, um, we talked um, a couple of weeks ago about the, the case of Wisconsin v. Yoder, um, thinking about religious liberty. Um, it's interesting to see here that, you know, this this idea of precedent is sort of this slow building of um, understanding around how these things are adjudicated, right? So our constitutional system is one in which things aren't prescribed for every case, which means um, that as, as we move through time, uh, -huh, it's up to us both to legislate, to figure out how we want to handle these things. And then for the court to adjudicate whether or not those are holding within sort of the, um, the ideals and the principles and the things that are outlined within the constitution, which is interesting. So I think calling that out as what precedent is doing here, I think is, is great because we're seeing that as they're quoting these other cases. Um, but also this phrase of the government thus carries a heavy burden of showing justification for the imposition of such a restraint is interesting. So Josh, you kind of um, tongue in cheek said, well, you know, it's almost basically always illegal. Well, I think what the court is saying here is, is yes, that the government has to prove that there is something really substantively important, meaning that the release of this kind of information is going to cause some kind of direct problem or harm um, and that it's on the government to show that it's not on the citizenry or, or the, the New York Times in this case to prove that whatever they're releasing isn't going to be a problem. It's on the government to prove the opposite. They have the government has to prove if they're going to prevent these things from being published, they have to, to have a very strong case as to why they're doing that. Um, otherwise, you know, freedom of the press. If we're thinking about like a scale, you know, <laughs> otherwise the freedom of the press continues to 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 outweigh any concerns that the government may have. And I think we begin to see that in some of these concurring opinions. So Justice Hugo Black um, wrote one of them, 
Um, and just to read it quickly, to find that the president has inherent power to halt the publication of news by resort to the courts would wipe out the First Amendment and destroy the fundamental liberty and security of the very people the government hopes to make secure. No one can read the history of the adoption of the First Amendment without being convinced beyond any doubt that it was injunctions like those sought here that Madison and his collaborators intended to outlaw in his nation for all time. Um, so here he's, he's citing James Madison, who famously introduced um, the, the amendments that became the Bill of Rights to the first Congress in order to be ratified. Um, and what they're talking about there is the spirit of this idea of what it means to have a free press, which is newspapers should be able to publish the information that they want to without the government coming in before it's even published and letting it out there. Um, which isn't to say that once a newspaper publishes something that they're not either culpable or that the reaction to it isn't on them or whatever else, but it's just saying that the government, the government cannot come in before it's published um, and, and, and prevent that from happening, um, except for extreme cases. Yeah, yeah. And what, what I find interesting is how he's, um, He's citing history as well. He's he's not saying this is my interpretation. He's saying this is what Madison intended. So you kind of have a original intense theory of of reading the Constitution here, and and I think that's important to to keep in mind is um, Justice Black's way of reading the Constitution might not be the same as the other justices read the Constitution, and and we need to keep that in mind as we look at each opinion and see how are they approaching that document and um, why are they approaching it in that way? Because they obviously are not all approaching it in that same way. Otherwise there would only be one opinion and they would all be unanimous in that opinion. Um, and so that doesn't necessarily mean that Justice Black is objectively correct or objectively wrong. It's just we see that they're they're basically having a conversation with each other in a way, very respectful conversation um, of uh, of just presenting the different ways they're viewing the Constitution. Yeah, no, I think that's really important, and I think it speaks to why we continue to have these conversations and look at these court cases because it's it's up to us to continue to think about these questions, to continue to think about the. Uh, obviously the discrete context of these cases, but then as we move again forward through history, um, how these same questions are coming up in different ways. And sometimes those differences can be really slight, but sometimes they're significant. And we have to be able to weigh, um, you know, what, what we think about these cases and apply it, you know, as we're, as we're moving forward and looking at new information. Um, so then we have another concurring opinion here from Justice Potter Stewart. And I should say, as always, unfortunately, we can only look at a few excerpts from um, these cases um, and these documents. We do this every um, other Thursday. I wish we had time to go through the entirety, um, but you know that, that we encourage you to go out and read it on your own. I promise you, you'll get a lot out of it. Um, but looking at that, this next section, you know, Justice Potter says, in the absence of the governmental checks and balances present in other areas of our national life, the only effective restraint upon executive policy and power in the areas of national defense and international affairs may lie in an enlightened citizenry. In an informed and critical public opinion, which alone can here protect the values of democratic government. For this reason, it is perhaps here that a press that is alert, aware, and free most vitally serves the basic purpose of the First Amendment. For without an informed and free press, there cannot be an enlightened people. Um, and w when I read this section, I immediately think again of James Madison, um, who called the, the uh, amendments and called the other pieces of the Constitution mere parchment barriers, right? Um, and, and by that, he meant that, look, you can have written down that Congress shall make no law that abridges the right to free press, but the only reason that ideal is upheld is if we as a citizenry value that thing. Um, and of course, you saw that early on with, you know, the Alien Sedition Acts in the 1790s, I mean, immediately after um, the Constitution is ratified, you have these questions coming up about, okay, well, we, we're, 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 we're in a war, we're on a war footing, uh, we don't want anti-government papers being published, um, and this is under the Adams administration, I believe, um, that, that they then shut down those newspapers, and, and that, you know, at the time was seen differently than it is now, but it's just this idea that Look, you know, it's on us. It doesn't matter that the law is written down. What matters is 
an enlightened citizenry, you know, meaning a knowledgeable and awake and aware citizenry is paying attention and holding the government accountable for the actions that it's committing. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a, it's, I don't want to say utilitarian, but um, kind of, it's kind of that argument here is, is it's not just a theory. It's here are some concrete examples of why freedom of the press is necessary and effective in a free society because it helps people make the best decision when you have a variety of ideas that are able to be expressed. People are going to be able to look at them, think about them, analyze them, and then come to the best conclusion. And uh, Justice Stewart argues that that's why the First Amendment was created. Yeah, absolutely. And so we didn't have a unanimous opinion, though it was that per curiam decision. Um, and here we have uh, Chief Justice uh, Warren Berger coming out and in, in providing his dissenting opinion. Um, he says, there is therefore little variation among the members of the court in terms of resistance to prior restraint against publication. Adherence to this basic constitutional principle, however, does not make these cases simple ones. In these cases, the imperative of a free and unfettered press comes into collusion with another imperative, the effective functioning of a complex modern government, and specifically the effective exercise of certain constitutional powers of the executive. Only those who view the First Amendment as an absolute in all circumstances, in all circumstances of you I respect but reject can find such cases as these to be simple or easy. Um, so what I hear Chief Justice Warren Berger saying here is, look, this right to a free press isn't absolute. There are rational times when it ought to be limited. Um, and you have to look at the context of each individual case to make that determination. And in this case, I think he's saying this does uh, reach a threshold where the publication of these papers is going to be damaging um, to the United States national security to the extent that they should be prohibited from publishing. Is that how you read it too, Josh? Yep. Yeah, exactly. So he even recognizes, look, we all have this common ground. We all are very resistant to prior restraint. Um, so they're all speaking a common language, we can see. However, there, there is some differences. And he's actually specifically calling out Justice Black indirectly, because Justice Black was well known for having a, an absolute literalist uh, interpretation of the First Amendment. And he says, I respect that, but I reject that. So again, he's, he's being very civil without this, even though he's dissenting, he's lost the case. He's still, uh, he's still being very civil towards the um, Justice Black and the majority. And that that's really stands out to me. Um, but, but he's saying, look, there, there are some times where prior restraint may be necessary. The First Amendment is not an absolute. Um, so he, uh, he would actually be more in line with Justice uh, Holmes and his famous opinion in uh, another well-known case, Schenck v. U.S., where he, he says, you can't shout fire in a crowded theater. Um, that would be a via, uh, the, the First Amendment doesn't protect that speech. So, um, and allowing that would, um, if, you, if you take a, a literal interpretation of the First Amendment, Holmes and Berger would say, then sure, I guess you can allow people to do that. Um, who cares about national security um, is, is how Berger would approach this. Yeah, it's interesting. Again, comes back on this theme that, you know, this is a balance, right? And that means, a balance means there's going to be people that view things in different ways. And so I think that's what's both interesting and sometimes can be frustrating about these Supreme Court cases is, look, there is no singular right answer, right? You have uh, really smart people coming to very different conclusions um, and all of us working together as a society trying to figure out, you know, what's best in, in each one of these cases. Um, and so we have one other um, uh, dissenting opinion here. Uh, here we have Justice John Marshall Harlan, um, who says the time which has been available to us, to the lower court and to the parties has been wholly inadequate for giving these cases the kind of consideration they deserve. It is a reflection on the stability of the judicial process that these great issues, as important as any that have arisen during my time in the court, should have been decided under the pressures engendered by the torrent of publicity that has attended these litigations from their inception. Um, so this is interesting to me because it seems like he's he's taking a different kind of tact. His 
frustration seems to be with sort of the timeline uh, on which this case was heard, argued, and decided, which, um, if I'm remembering correctly, w- was pretty quick. Is that right, Josh? Yeah, it was It was incredibly quick. Um, far quicker than I think most, if any other court cases of, of this magnitude were decided. And, and the reason so was um, the New York Times and the Washington Post had an injunction against them. And so the the majority of the court reasoned we need to move through this quick because um, any any moment of restraining the press is is a gross violation of the First Amendment. So we need to get through this quick. That's how the majority viewed it. Now, Justice Harlan, however, is actually approaching it the opposite way. And he's saying, well, if this is so important, we actually want to take our time um, and make sure that we get it right. Uh, because it's, he says, it's it's not certain that prior restraint in this case is unconstitutional, so we shouldn't just rush into lifting that injunction. We we should get it right. And he's kind of referencing the rule of law here, uh, reflection on the stability of the judicial process. So he's saying we what makes America so great is that we do have a stable judiciary. And one thing that comes along with that is having this slow, even-keeled process where we don't rush into things. We make sure we take our time and think, think them through before we hand down a decision that is going to establish precedent for a long time to come. Yeah, and I think that speaks to another inherent tension that's built into the constitutional framework, which is this sort of balance between passion and reason, um, deliberation and action, right? Um, and, and this can be frustrating. I mean, it's politicians uh, throughout American history, particularly in the 20th century, I'm thinking here of Woodrow Wilson, you know, uh, getting very frustrated with this like slow, deliberative, thoughtful process. Um, obviously that's on the legislative side, but here on the judicial side, you see it too. You, there's, this, there's this desire to come to a correct decision. There's this desire to come to Um, a well-reasoned decision, um, and that these decisions have long-lasting consequences. And that's all balanced against the need for this to happen rapidly in order for it to be just. Because you can imagine a scenario in which this injunction stays, and by injunction, we just mean that the New York Times and and Washington Post, who's also um, a part of this um, lawsuit in a slightly different manner, but um, not to go too much into that, but that they're unable to publish these things that they want to publish because the court has ordered them to stop. And so there's this need for um, the court to move rapidly to resolve this so that it's not something that is unduly um, punitive against these papers who are just wanting to, to publish this information. Um, and I, I, you know, I think that's almost another constitutional question around which you could you could consider this entire case because it's a it's an important principle, and, and that stability of the judiciary, I think, is is what gives weight to all of these court cases, right? And and makes us believe that they are th- that they have the authority that they have is that they are well reasoned and thought out. Um, and I think John Marshall Harlan here is calling out, saying, "Hey, like let's let's be careful. Um, this is really fast. It was pushed on us. We decided on it really quickly. Let's make sure that that doesn't come at the cost of uh, the the court losing some of its." Um, legitimacy in the eyes of the public or trust in the eyes of the public, I think. Yeah, definitely. And, and his, what he's talking about here, it, it's, um, you know, it becomes tricky. Like what, what is an adequate amount of time? It, it really kind of comes down to each justice's individual uh, subjective opinion on that. Um, mm-hmm. Like, and so the, the court here isn't always just deciding uh, like, you know, objective constitutional questions. They're kind of having to use their own interpretations on, on what seem like minor details. You know, what, how long should a case be on the docket? How long should oral arguments last? Things like that. But the, those things are very much on their minds as they're, as they're considering these questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so to conclude, Josh, let's go back to this big constitutional question that we have, right? Um, so how should the United States balance freedom of the press and national security? So from this case, what I'm what I take away is look, the 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 balance is really that, you know, we have a free press unless there is a very clear and very um, strong, compelling reason uh, that the government needs to uh, prevent the publication of something or stop the publication of something. Um, and in this particular case, 
it doesn't reach that level of of interest for the government. Right. Yep. Exactly. So, yeah, prior restraint very very difficult to enact. Um, but on the other hand, as we saw, if if three justices were going to dissent, um, the, it's obviously not just entirely clear cut and. And I think even the majority actually references there may be some times where prior restraint in a very, very extreme situation could be used. We're talking the press says, here's the number of troops. Here's exactly where they're going to land at this exact time. Here's their strategy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe we could use prior restraint for that. Um, so I, it's interesting. There, there is definitely a balance there and, and the court grappled with it um, a lot because they knew how important this case was. And we all know just with the digital world, um, information so easy to get, uh, so easy to release that it's it's only going to um, be a matter of time before this question comes up again. Absolutely. Well, Josh, thanks again for joining me. This was a really interesting case to work through. Um, like you said, I can imagine this coming up um, again in the future as we continue to work through this digital age. Um, in fact, recently, uh, this issue kind of came up in, in uh, one of the podcasts that the Bill of Rights Institute releases, the podcast called Fabric of History. Um, and we were talking about um, spies and national security. Um, and, and our guest on that episode had some really interesting things to say. So I encourage everybody to, to check out the podcast as well if you're interested in this question. Um, and um, Josh, I'm sure that you'll have your eye on the news and any new e-lessons or anything else that come out um, may deal with this question as well. Um, but thank you all again for joining us. Um, please remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video content. Um, we release videos every week here at the Bill of Rights Institute, um, whether they're these uh, primary source close reads or their conversations with scholars working in history and in politics. Um, we also release uh, digital uh, image close reads, so looking at different images and cartoons and art from history um, and unpacking those, um, as well as pedagogically focused materials um, and our homework help series, which Josh has a big help on and in fact um, is coming out with a case uh, or a video about uh, New York Times company um, versus New York. So if you're interested in finding more about this case, more about the background of the case, how it got to the court, um, check out that video. Um, and uh, as always, please feel free to reach out to us on Twitter and on Facebook. Uh, we always want to hear different topics that you may want to go into, or if you have questions, we're happy to answer those. Um, but until next time, Josh, thanks again. Thank you. And we'll see you all next time.